Thank you uh, so very much for that fantastic presentation and the, the fishes I will keep. Uh, but as I'm not uh, only the CEO of the Swedish Gender Equality Institute, which is sort of what I'm out talking about, uh, I am for the Swedish Film Institute, and I thought maybe we'd just go through a clip of what films were actually having premiere in the year 2017 in Sweden. And I think we have a clip. Why do I show this? This was the first year that the premieres in Sweden were 50-50 on the cinemas. And it takes a while, you know, for the de decisions to reach the screen. Uh, and so we've been lacking in the numbers. 2017 was as well the first year where Swedish films got the international prize in the Sundance Festival, got the debut prize at the Venice Festival, actually, we got the Golden Palm in Cannes. We got the Cristal in Annecy. We got the uh, Lux Prize of the European Parliament. And we won six prizes uh, for the same film in the European Film Awards. These are a lot of prizes. And the people behind were 50-50. So I think that I've proven that it's not about the quality. It's about something else. And it's about unconscious bias of who is doing quality. And I just want to share with you the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I know some of you have heard it, but just to make sure everyone always remembers what unconscious bias means. It means that when the Boston Symphony Orchestra wanted more women in their orchestra, they made the audition anonymously. On a stage, in a theater, behind closed curtains, with men and women. So especially welcome the few men that are here, because it's not about you, it's about us. Both to be able to change, but as well, who are the ones with the unconscious bias? So the jury, the men and the women, were supposed to pick the best musicians in all their different songs. And they picked more men, even though the curtains were closed, which was a big disappointment, of course. But then they redid the audition. The same musicians coming in, the same jury picking, but, and closed curtains, but this time with a thick carpet on the floor so you couldn't hear the steps. <laughs> yes, you're a clever audience. They suddenly picked 50-50. And I think that is what it's all about. 
We expect men to be better. We fall in love with the young men when they are coming out. We do want always the women, but the media repeats these fantastic male names, so we forget about the women. So, I say, as the head of the Swedish Film Institute, my assignment is to make sure that we fund films with quality potential. And with quality, we have actually said that we need to define that. Because what I met when I came to the Swedish Film Institute, and as you heard, I'm a lawyer from the beginning, so I'm kind of, you know, the, the argument, you could feel it in your stomach, is not good enough for me. So I try to make the decision makers to actually argue a little bit better about the quality, which was very hard. So we agreed, or I agreed, and I made the other ones agree with me, that they should argue from three words, which are relevance of a film story or urgency of a film story. Why should we make that film today? What's about this story that would attract the audience? Because it's the audience we talk about, right? It's not about someone wanting to tell a story. It has to have some kind of relevance for people to see it. Is it anything new with the story? Is it anything original or have we seen it before? And the third one is, do we believe that this film will actually reach a screen with production value? Is it good craft enough? And of course, that third part is due to experience and track record and the compilation of the group that are making the film. But the first two are really only about the story. So I made my people having to argue about this, even in writing which they, it took me years to get them to do that because it's so unusual because we've had the notion that quality uh, seekers are people with special fingertips or something, that they have a gift that is n n not possible to even explain. And uh, I don't believe in that. So, uh, I don't know if you see the chart that I'm showing here. But what I as well make sure is the audience or the reach. So you can see that we are making what we call a success chart. As Peter Dinges said from the FFA, I love the Swedish Red Cross. And uh, so this is it. Welcome to our world. On this uh, angle, you have the critic awards and the submissions to the top 10 international festivals. And you can get up to, up to five points for the Critic Awards and an extra two points depending on which festival and if you get awarded. So when we got the square in the Cannes competition, he earned one and a half points, but winning the prize made him reach the top. So. That chart is that kind of quality, which is exactly actually what Elizabeth was describing. How do we say quality in festivals? It's because we know that there is a big selection made there. On the other one, it's uh, admissions actually only in theaters, which I know is not good enough, but that's the only numbers we have. And what I ask my uh, people is, where do you believe that this film will end up? Is it on A, which would be very high critic awards, maybe very good festival life, which means an international audience is interested and the international world is interested. You both reach more people, but you build the Swedish brand of film. Uh, on the other hand, you have the B position, which would be both getting a national big audience and an international big audience. That is, of course, what everyone should aim for. So what I demand is that the decision makers can argue for that the film is either on the A or between the A and the B. 
if the uh, filmmakers and the decision makers say, yeah, but you know, we're happy with the D corner, which means a lot of admissions, but very low awards in the papers and very bad for the brand of Swedish films because everyone will say that this is mediocre and we can't do film, which was exactly what everyone said when I started off. They said that, yeah, Swedish film is so bad, we are not happy, and that is usually a good starting point for doing change. So in every country I ask them, are you happy with the situation? Do you really believe that you have the best films you could ever get? And I never heard one up to now saying, yes, we're totally happy, can't get anything better. <laughs> we do accept that the actual films land in the position C and D, because that, may, that only shows that we do take risk, and we have to take risk as well. So you can fail, and that is totally okay if you don't do it all the time. And it is totally okay for both men and women. So, what I said to my people was that to be able to get the highest quality, we need to work with gender equality. I started a new hashtag, actually, when I was in Barcelona last week, talking to their politicians. Uh, and that, that hashtag is, quality needs gender equality. Because if you don't have the whole talent base, how will you ever be able to get the highest quality? And saying this, that we need the gender equality and the diversity, of course, letting all new voices get the same possibility to get our money, then we can actually say that we are doing our ut utmost to actually get the highest quality. And by doing this, not only the women got to do the films, but the men shaped up. The Swedish production companies realized, shit, it's a harder way to the money. We went from saying 85% no to 95% no. And as we are very clear in, if you, have, if you can't say that there is a possibility for the A to the B corner, then we're not interested because there are others out there that actually have the potential. And then they started to doing the script preparations uh, with a longer term and all the development for a longer time because they realized that if they didn't show that, they would never reach the quality. So uh, the gender equality was exactly that. Start of point, no happy. Uh, admirable point, 50-50. And then to get to a target uh, in any change management, you need a strategy and you need a budget. So the strategy was to have an action plan because you have to go from talk to action. And I'm happy about the, all the international film festivals, but the jury, even though they are compiled 50-50, there, there are 50-50 maybe but 100% may be unconscious biased. So the women will just assure that, yeah, it was about the quality. Look, it's all about the men. So I'm a bit afraid of that. So I really want everyone to push them into the next level, which would be take some training. Because in either, any other area where you want to do change, you take help. If you want to change office space, any uh, management would say, what do we actually need? How do we get effective? What, what is the mo perfect office space for us? And then they take in a consultant who will do these interviews and whatever they do, and they come back and say, yeah, you need 200 square meters, you need an open area, the coffee machine over there, and everyone says, thank you very much, pay the bill. So what I say is that when I see that the festivals actually take a consultant to help them educate not only the selecting committees, but themselves as well. I do that in the Swedish Film Institute over and over again, because everyone that I employ is starting off from the first point again. 
yeah, but you know, I tried a woman, and yeah, you know the story. There aren't any women. So there are these common arguments, and they never change. So to make the action plan a bit understandable for the media, because the media plays an important role here, uh, we just picked out a few, and we made the arguments, really, to have an action, because I really knew what I wanted to do. But the first action is exactly what Elizabeth said. There are very few competent women. There aren't any. Which is, of course, totally false. And we know that history erases women. So what we have done is that we have started off a site which is called the nordicwomeninfilm.com where we have gotten researchers in film history to dig out the women in the key positions of uh, directing, scriptwriting, producing, editing and cinematographers uh, from the start of the history to show that there are women and there has always been women. The first long feature is in all the history books, Griffiths, A Birth of a Nation. And we all know that that is false, that it's a woman. Lois Weber and Alice, uh, whatever her name is, uh, you see, not even me remembers it. And I've been talking about this so much because we never get to hear that. Lois Weber made a hundred long features and she's not even able to search in the databases. Not until you search on her husband's name, you can find her, because he had a very talented wife called Lois. That's all there is. So this is a way of showing the history, but as well adding on all women that are in the industry, not the ones that want to be in the industry, but actually are professionals. Uh, so we have one person working with this, which means, yes, I do have to pay another salary. And I think that I've been paying so many salaries for uh, finding the men in the archives or library and whatever it is. So you have to rethink your budget, not ask for more money to make it professional, but actually to use your money in a more professional way. So, and then there is this argument, and this goes mostly for the big budgets. She's not experienced enough. Men are picked on potential, women on experience. Which means that men is always found to have the potential, and women never. So I said in Cannes, if I don't see that the industry starts working with us in this, because it's the same thing in Sweden, we are considering giving the high budget funding in the year 2020, the, that only year, give that ratio only to women. To, so they are able to get the experience, then they can be picked on experience. And wow, the shit hit the storm, I can tell you. <laughs> I thought a threat, which I've been doing all the time, I've always said that if you, the industry doesn't work with me, I'm not afraid of quotas. But I don't want to do it, because then you only talk about the quota. So I did a new threat, and we've been in an election time, so maybe that's why. But my God, uh, I've been in all editorials as the woman who is destroying freedom of speech, and the freedom of art, because I'm politically steering the content of the film. And maybe I am, as Elizabeth showed you, we know that if there are women behind the camera, there are more women on the screen. So in that sense, yes. But knowing that you have a selection system that is not equal and just shows as well that if you don't do anything about that, that is as politically as doing something. Both is a choice. But uh, uh, it was blowing a lot in my hair during those days. We still have a lot of studies to do. I'm happy that my fellow researchers here uh, are helping us because we have to understand what happens in film schools and what happens when they reach the market. 
And in the Swedish Film Institute, we've had in our action plan to reach those wise with uh, knowledge. And we nowadays make reports yearly. Last year, it was how we became what is gender equal country, and we are not. We, we are one of the few countries in the world that have never had uh, a female head of our country, for instance. Uh, compared to you, you've had it for many years. Uh, so we're not gender equal, but that is really what everyone is believing. So we need to understand much more and we need to do much more research. And this year we are doing a report on the money. What happens when you have a female protagonist compared to a male? So I see that we should connect more about that. How much money do female directors get from distributors? A lot of who owns the production companies. So the decisions by, behind the money. Counting is essential because counting counting and talking about the numbers makes everyone aware. So what we are doing is that we are counting on every time we are making decisions. I have passed my 20 minutes, so I will rush through this. Uh, but do the counting all the time, not once a year, because that's too seldom and you report it a few months later and then the next year is already almost gone. We did even more research with the industry and it was very hard to get the industry to work with us because they were mostly men. But I would say that the men that actually participated, it was Anna Wall, I know she's been here, uh, that was doing it. And uh, the ones that actually participated are now our best ambassadors because they got the awareness, they did the ed education that I demand from the film festivals. So, yes, we did reach parity. And this is the proof it wasn't a quota. It goes up and down from each year. We make too few decisions to be able to have 50-50 every year. We talk over time. And in Sweden, the women won 56% of all awards. In the world, we have, as you can see, women not only in the competitions or in the festivals, but actually as well winning prizes. So it's not about the quality, but it's about changing the structure. And when we reached the 2016, which was the end of our first period, I realized we haven't changed the structures at all. We have changed the way we are dealing with the money. It's our money only. So that's why we invented the new action plan, which we named 5050 by 2020. And uh, it has, as you said, it spread because it's very catchy and was actually invented by NASA. But NASA also has the line, failure is not an option. And I thought that was perfect. So we took that. So we are continuing. I think uh, there were time for a few questions, is that correct? Yes. Yep. Iris. <laughs> My friend. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. You told us so much about the actions uh, you are taking uh, on gender equality. Um, but as far as I know, Sweden is, is one, or maybe probably the only country, who has taken actions uh, after, who, who took actions after um, Me Too. Yeah. You were mentioning yeah. the green card over there. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, sorry, uh, I should have mentioned that. So we have a lot of requirements to get our money. I guess all countries have. We do it to the professional industry. You need to have a whole team, blah, blah, blah. A lot of, a lot of conditions follows our money. But we never, 
I mean, we all knew about sexual harassment, right? Uh, at least everyone who is a woman knows that we have been sexually harassed, bigger or smaller. So uh, when we realized in the Me Too movement that there has been to that degree, uh, it was impossible not to do something more. So what we did was that we very fast implemented a requirement for the production companies that will get production funding, the actual funding decision, needs to show us that they have taken new education in the reasons for the sexual harassment. And they are, of course, the different structures and who is in power and who is not. Exactly the same structures that leads that you have more male directors than female directors. But the sexual harassment, we have very many laws about that that no one followed. So they knew about the law, or I, at least we said that we expect you to know about the laws. But obviously you don't know how to act to not breach the laws. So we made that. It's a one-day education that we give for free, or they can find any other education. And it turned out we had to fund it because no one wanted to pay for it. Uh, but that was another shitstorm. That was as well me uh, misusing the money uh, and state money opening up for a situation where we had value-driven content. But we're not doing action plan for content. We are doing action plan for who gets to do film and how is the working environment. So that is the part of the green card that was aiming directly to the Me Too. And uh, actually the producers and directors of the production companies have been so happy because no one wants a, a, a film shooting that has a lot of sexual harassment, but it's not like it's easy to get rid of it. So getting them to get tools to actually work with this and get a network with other CEOs and producers have been really good for their, uh, their possibilities to get help. So they love these days. But the, the film and TV producers guild hates the action. It's a requirement, we don't like that. Yeah. Scotty, hi. Hi, um, since my job later is to talk about diversity, yeah. I would like to ask you whether, apart from the gender equity, you have a specific plan or action or plan yeah. to, to uh, look into diversity on a lot of other categories like age, disability, uh, ethnicity and so on? We have an action plan of greater representation and accessibility actually and that is really partly uh, to be able for the, uh, uh, the human rights laws not if there are discrimination grounds. But I think that is one part. The big part is who gets to do the film uh, in terms of ethnical background. Because as well, when you get other voices to be behind the camera, you see other faces on the screen. Uh, so we have an action plan uh, and we have fulfilled it quite a lot. Uh, but I think it's very hard to count. So we are now doing a big job in how to, how to count not to uh, hurt people. And uh, that this takes time and it's very frustrating. Uh, but you may have seen that it is actually quite a lot of diversity. But we are not at all happy with how many new voices we get to see uh, from the production companies. Uh, so we have a big job to do there as well. <laughs>